Well, thank you for joining us. My name is Catherine Achenga, and this is Walking the Talk. Now, today we will be focusing on International Anti-Corruption Day. As we celebrate this particular day, it's been 16 years since the UN General Assembly declared the International Anti-Corruption Day. What are some of the successes that we are celebrating and what are the challenges that we continue to experience? Of course, statistics by UNDP uh, indicate that at least $1 trillion is lost annually through bribes and 2.6 billion shillings is also lost as a result of corruption. So what really are the issues? And here in Kenya, how are we marking this particular day? And what are some of the things that we need to continue doing in order to eradicate corruption? Well, for more insights on that, joining me this evening, I will be engaging the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission chairperson, that is retired Archbishop Eliud Wabukala, who will be putting into perspective some of the things that the commission is doing to try and ensure the problem of corruption is eradicated. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, Indeed, we are all excited about celebrating the International Anti-Corruption Day. But even as we look forward to this day, do we have anything to celebrate as Kenyans? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chenga. We are very glad that uh, you have come on board to help us uh, tell Kenyans about the celebration on the 9th of December. First, I want to invite all of us to the fact that on 9th of December, every year, the whole world celebrates uh, the fight against corruption. Yeah. And Kenya being a signatory of the many world treaties about corruption, we have put in place uh, uh, activities which are going on to ensure that we talk about corruption. So if you assess where we are as a country, yes. would you say we have something to celebrate in the steps that we have taken uh, to try and fight graft? I think so. We, we have quite a lot to celebrate now. Because uh, I remember way back in, in fighting corruption, yeah. I've noticed this war now. Okay. I started by chairing the National Anti-Corruption Campaign Steering Committee uh, around 2003. And that time, we never talked about corruption. Yeah. We just said chai, you know, kitu kidogo. Kitu kidogo. You know, those, those were the terms because people feared. But so far, we have come to a stage where everybody now can talk about corruption openly. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have an opportunity now at the highest level of our political uh, class, they support corruption. Mm -hmm. The president has been very firm and clear about it. No, no stone is going to be left untouched. Mm -hmm. uh, we have parliament giving us proper legislation yeah. and guidance in terms of fighting corruption. We have set up a multi-agency team involving government, private sector, religious sector. All these people are now focused on corruption. Yeah. So I think we can celebrate that kind of spirit that all of us have come. And even Kenyans personally, mm -hmm. you know this time Kenyans are talking about it. Uh, when we arrest somebody to ASC previously, mm -hmm. our, our, our people will come with this person and say, this is our thief. Mm -hmm. So, so don't deal with it. But now, that thing is now law. So I would say we can celebrate. Uh, but above all, <coughs> we can celebrate in terms of ESC as the lead agency of fighting corruption has now become more visible. Um, ESC has a legal framework that has helped it to uh, investigate cases of corruption yeah. very highly now. Yes, it has a legal framework that helps us to recover assets mm -hmm. as well as finances. We have recovered cash, we have recovered uh, uh, preserved and recovered assets worth billions of money. Yeah. Um, ESC has the capacity now to teach awareness around the country. Uh, we also have involved ourselves in terms of dealing with the values of the society. As a, as, as, a, as a strategy to change ourselves so that we can deal with corruption. Mm -hmm. We'll be looking more at you know, the values that you've been able to inculcate over time. But in terms of challenges, what are still the things that you need to address as a commission if we are to talk about ending corruption in this country? Yeah, you see, corruption um, is something that mutates, uh, still continues. And I think as we talk about challenges, let me first begin with um, the people ourselves first. Mm -hmm. We must change our concept, our paradigm shift in terms of understanding 
what is corruption? What, what are the effects of corruption? When, when you tell a Kenyan you're talking about corruption, what do you think they understand by that word? Yes, I, I, will, I will bring it down to how corruption makes us to suffer. Yeah. There, the roads are not there. When people have taken the money that was supposed to build roads, you find some place has no roads. Uh, there will be no water in the villages mm -hmm. because somebody has taken money which have, may have built a dam. You know, there will be no um, uh, medicine in the, in, in the hospital because the money that was supposed to bring uh, medicine is not in the hospital. Mm -hmm. People will not be paid well. Uh, the schools will have no uh, materials for our children. So corruption affects us directly. And as a Kenyan, therefore, it is us to make sure it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But most of the times when you tell Kenyans the word corruption, they think about, you know, the money that is being lost in tenders, yeah. the big money. Mm -hmm. But is that all it's about? Are we able to speak to, you know, the small mamambogas mm -hmm. out here to understand that corruption begins at that level, not just at the much bigger level? I think uh, you are very right. Is that uh, we, we sometimes look at corruption at the bigger level. There were days uh, when uh, people would say, get the big fish yeah. first. But they also forget that even in the villages, as we speak, there are mamambogas who are being harassed there. There are people who are suffering uh, in terms of uh, uh, corruption in the villages through the village elders. They are not getting justice. The local police stations, for example, they may not give a P3 to someone who has been beaten and this person may be an old lady who needs support. So this corruption is right from inside the house up to the big offices. Mm -hmm. But we just trying to categorize it and, and then say, as, as a, for example, a commission, where, to, where should we hit most yeah. so that we can give an impact? And uh, that we have a strategy on how to ensure that we hit most so that we see how we can cascade this down to the houses. So that one you're referring to the to the big fish, the yeah. one that Kenyans like. To of course, so we, 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 maybe I will say that um, our priority is that if the, if the corruption involves a personality that is prominent, mm -hmm. we go for that. Mm -hmm. If it involves huge sums of money, we go for that. Mm -hmm. If it involves a, a lot of public interest, yeah. we go for that. So that informs our approach to making sure that that hitting at the top makes ripples to reach and get yeah, the, the bottom. Yeah. All right. Before we talk about you know hitting you know the, the those who are already involved in corruption, is there a way that we can go back and stop this corruption from happening, prevent it in the first place? Uh, uh, thank you. I think prevention is, is, is as as doctors say, is better than cure. And for me, I think that would be the easiest way to stop corruption. When I started the work on this uh, in this commission, I just one had I had one just concept one uh, that what corrupts starts uh, comes from inside. It is out of our heart that bad things begin to come, yeah. and therefore, if we can heal that part, then we are able to deal with corruption. What am I saying? I'm saying that um, at individual level, we should determ be determined to say no to corruption. Uh, when you see a corrupt uh, practice, somebody is, is being bribed, or you suspect somebody has stolen the money, report it. Uh, if it is you in that environment, take a decision, a personal decision, and say, I'm not going to steal. Mm -hmm. Because when I steal, I'm affecting the bigger public. So prevention for me is bigger, but it also hinges on um, the kind of people and society we are. So what strategies perhaps do you have as ESCC to prevent uh, incidences of corruption from um, happening? We, uh, maybe I could have widened a bit of what we do. We have, of course, various departments in this commission. Yeah. Uh, investigations, which now you hear about uh, cases being people arrested. That's what people know as more. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have asset tracing and recovery. Mm -hmm. When people have stolen, uh, we must, must go for what they have stolen. Yeah that we are making very good progress yeah. and then we have preventive uh, approach which for us is to make awareness in the public we use media uh, we, we are now right now actually on social media as well and then we then go to education 
uh, we have given our input to the curriculum development in this country mm -hmm. so that uh, the CPC that is now launched, we have uh, influenced its uh, value uh, approach to teaching. Yeah. Uh, simple things like telling our children, if you have given your child uh, food, for example, after you're sitting, yes. he comes to say, Mommy, thank you, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Or just greeting you, um, you know, this courtesy, this hospitality issues, this is our traditional life that was rich. That has been put in the, in the teaching uh, materials where the, the experiences that teachers take through the children will form them into uh, good people. So we are trying to approach the value system from schools. Um, we have, I think, started so many integrity clubs yeah. in, in, uh, in schools. How do these integrity you know, clubs work? <coughs> well, what, what happens is that we have developed materials yeah. which we go to schools, uh, introduce these materials to the, to the, to the students, yeah. just like they have various activities like uh, Christian unions, football clubs, mm -hmm. so they also have an integrity club. Yeah. Now this integrity club will teach these participants um, how to be good people in the school. And we have learned <coughs> that schools which have that have actually not participated in strikes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, members of integrity clubs become mentors mm -hmm. of the others in that school. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, this has been taken over by the, the ministry. They have given circulars yeah. for this to happen in every school in, every school. in our country. Mm -hmm. What about the integrity academies? Uh, how? how how the impact, have you begun to feel the impact in terms of training and changing the perception of the personnel? Okay, I think developing from the decorated clubs, uh, one of the things I think I did when I came here was to see how we can <coughs> now teach uh, issues in integrity to a wider society. And so we started and registered an integrity academy. Uh, this academy is focusing on um, top leadership at most. We have uh, trained and continue to be training uh, the county government. We have even had governors. We have had uh, public servants. Uh, we have had, uh, of course, it's open to even the private sector. Yeah. Yeah, but we, 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 may, we may, for example, take procurement, mm -hmm. but we deal with procurement in a way that addresses the value issues within procurement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so as we move forward and, and just looking at where we are currently, would you say there is a high level of awareness on corruption or is it that corruption is happening more, that's why we are hearing more and more cases, or, or what really would you say, would you attribute? Well, I, I think measuring the, the way corruption is, we, we normally do a survey, an annual survey, and just last month we released one. What we noticed was that, uh, of course, the awareness is there. People are aware about corruption. They are also still asking questions, where do I report you know, if I get a corruption uh, issue? Uh, but uh, generally, Kenyans are aware. What we now need to do is to translate that awareness into action. Mm -hmm. And uh, in action, I think our report showed that um, the kind of bribes that were taken the previous year, the amount has lowered gone down. Uh, we also re registered significant, I mean, some improvement in certain sectors in terms of uh, fighting corruption is involved. So we are in, in, a, in a position where, given the political will and uh, the strong legislative uh, support, mm -hmm. and then our people's direct involvement, we, we can begin to stigmatize corruption. Mm -hmm. And once we, we reach there, I think we shall be on the way to making Kenya a, a relatively corrupt-free country. Mm -hmm. So has it slowed down? Has corruption slowed down? Well, I, I think so, but uh, the challenge we have, which is okay for me, is that uh, there is now more media exposed. You know, previously it was not possible. Mm -hmm. But the media exposed now makes it like everybody is talking about corruption. Yeah. And you will think it is really the thing of every day. Mm -hmm. but. That's because we are in an age where it is possible to expose it. Mm -hmm. So both efforts, exposing and fighting, will go together uh, until we reach a point where 
uh, personally we say no. And uh, once we reach that stage where people will say, yes, this is a bad thing, let's leave it, then we shall begin to see the downward uh, trend. Of course, we always talk about corruption fighting back. And uh, we've seen incidences where perhaps some of the police officers uh, have come to be arrested by ESCC officers and, and you know, they sort of want to fight back. Uh, I mean, what does it mean for your officers in terms of their safety and uh, the public awareness? How are you addressing that as a commission? Well, I think that you are very right. Corruption fights back in very many ways. Um, first, they, they would, they, those may, you know, make a, a, a kind of uh, narrative against the, the institution. Yeah. They, would, they would say everybody is corrupt, what have you. But when you check into it, you find it's not true. Uh, negative publicity is there. But uh, more so for us is that our officers are at risk. Uh, we have had several times when they have gone out there and been injured. Uh, they come back really tired and all that. So. We, we have set in, in place uh, where we ourselves together you know, support each other in terms of uh, ecologically and if it is a challenge, for example, physical, we see how to support each other. Of course, um, ours is professional. When you see that they go out, they, they have a manual that guides all the activities we do. They also operate within the law. Uh, so, and then the mandate that is given in the law. So when we reach there and then people fight them, those people are obstructing justice. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, we of course take it, the law to address it. Uh, but one thing I'm very happy about is that uh, <coughs> the recent case, I think it was in Kisumu, yes. where Wanainji themselves helped us to get the people. I think let Wanainji do that. Mm -hmm. When they see we are out there supporting the own corruption. Let them come in and support it. Mm -hmm. But uh, my advice to all of us as Kenyans is never resist the, the law because it doesn't help at all. Mm -hmm. uh, comply and it makes work very easy for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, after all, um, when one is said to be corrupt, you have been captured, you have, that doesn't mean everything is finished because the justice system will take over and if you are not, you will be vindicated. Mm -hmm. So it is no need for people to start uh, running away from the justice that we are executing by our mandate. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's always been the debate in as much as you go after you know, the police officer who is receiving the bribe. Uh, there's always been the question of what about the giver of the bribe? What you know, repercussions are there for them? Because as long as you don't touch me when I give the bribe, I will continue giving the bribe. Well, thank you for that. That's a nice question, Chenga, because uh, when, when I came here in 2017, the first uh, law that I officiated to begin was Bribery Act 2016. Yes. And uh, this Bribery Act gives us uh, the capacity to arrest the giver and also the taker. As I speak, uh, we have two or three uh, people in the Matatu industry who are bribing police and we have taken them to court. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so there is a law now addressing that. We are, they are working on the regulations, yes, but as it gets strengthened, I think people should now be aware that when you give a bribe, you are as equally liable to uh, criminality like the one who is receiving. Mm -hmm. In terms of implementation, how, you know, how far is, has it gone? Because I don't think majority of Kenyans yeah. even know that there are well, certain penalties attached to it. Yes, yes. I, I think that, that's, as I've, as I've said, regulations are still on, on being developed. But so far, mm -hmm. uh, those who are being taken to court, they may suffer some uh, cash punishment, or maybe imprisonment, you know, I can't specify the real time, but maybe six months or so. But there is a real punishment on the giver if he's uh, found guilty. Mm -hmm. Perhaps in terms of an example for Kenyans <coughs> to appreciate what this act does, if I'm found giving a bribe of a thousand shillings, what is it that I, you know, I expect to, to happen to me? I think uh, you are right. In terms of giving, uh, again, I don't want to say a thousand shillings is small, Therefore, you should continue giving it. Yes. <laughs> but uh, 
if it is a thousand and one has bribed a company, a company has bribed a, 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 bribed a government yeah. servant for millions, of course the sentence will be different. Mm -hmm. You will receive a, a, a shorter one, mm -hmm. but the one giving, uh, like for example, uh, big companies, eh? some, some of them are international companies, yes. they go to bribe the tendering system. At that level, what sometimes a commission does is to blacklist that uh, company. Uh, the penalty is that they will, be, they will be debarred and publicized not to participate in uh, contracts at, at all. And you know that's very serious if it's an international company. It means that if Kenya has, 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 has blacklisted you, yes. you cannot operate elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah, so those uh, punishments are there depending on the kind of uh, activity involved. Mm -hmm. All right. In terms of trying to address graft within, you know, the public sector, uh, we've had the debate on uh, if you're employed by the government, you should not be doing business with the government. Do you think this, in a way, will deter incidences of graft? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Doing government, doing business with government. I think <coughs> I, if I go to history again, this was the, the Degwa Commission around 1972, which started that. I, I was lucky to be part of civil service then. Uh, <coughs> the argument was uh, people in the private sector were earning more money. <coughs> they had better lives. And therefore they wanted to motivate this very newly independent country, civil servants, also to have something. And they opened the floodgates and said, you can't participate in, uh, in business with government. Now that has already been mistaken and taken badly so that uh, their conflict of interest is now a big challenge yes. where you offer yourselves a contract where you are working and that becomes a challenge. So we have to address that um, through the conflict of interest bill which is there. We also... It's before parliament. Uh, yes, before parliament. We also, I think, we need to encourage more legislation on that so that we stop completely uh, civil servants participating in business with government. Yeah, because uh, then the conflict of interest will be lessened. Mm -hmm. What about those who, you know, will use proxies? Because most of the times they don't do it directly. Yeah. It's always through a proxy. How will you check on that? Uh, proxy, yes. <coughs> but, uh, I think the argument has been your spouse, your children, and um, <coughs> I don't know which other relatives. But at the end of the day, for me, I think it is the integrity of the officer. Because um, you may not use your immediate family, but of course you can create other friendships. Uh, but the challenge is that the law is there, we shall reach there. But as we speak today, there are cases where um, we trace money going through companies which are not for relatives and then they move on and back to the person who was raised the giving the, the, the tender. So it is for me um, the integrity of the people in the offices that is going to be of help for us here. Yeah. When we talk about integrity, we go back to <coughs> chapter 6 of our constitution. <coughs> it talks about leadership and integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always the general feeling that that chapter in itself hasn't really affected the change that we had hoped in terms of how the public you know, elects their leaders, uh, the kind of people who they look up to. So as a commission and also as the chair of the commission, how do we ensure the implementation of you know, the values that are envisaged in the constitution when it comes to leadership and integrity? Thank you. I think all that we have been talking about, about the values, teaching of the values, I think it emanates again mm -hmm. <coughs> from that uh, aspect of the chapter 6. And for me, it's not just chapter 6 alone. I think we have uh, in the constitution various uh, sections where objects, values uh, of, our, of, of our society are mentioned. Now, as a commission, uh, chapter 6 has a directorate here which then uh, deals with vetting uh, of those who are aspiring for political office. 
not vetting basically, but receiving declarations about them. And of course, we look at whether they qualify or not and recommend to the IEBC. Uh, we also have, we receive declaration of income, of wealth, people's yeah, wealth. Declaration. Yeah, wealth declaration. We receive those forms. But we are also saying we need stronger re legislation around that. We have recommended that. Uh, that these forms should go online, Rambo, <coughs> so that uh, you and me can just click the button and see what we own. And that will help us to monitor uh, people's uh, you know, engagement in the public. If somebody went there with one without a, a car, tomorrow he has three or four, we ask, how did you get it? And we know your salary uh, for what we are calling a lifestyle audit. That's important. We also think that um, the, the teaching around integrity that we are undertaking is, is also emanating from that Leadership and Integrity uh, Act. You're watching Walk in the Talk. It's time for us to take a short break, but of course we are engaging the ESCC chairperson that is retired Archbishop Eliud Wabukala, who is putting into perspective uh, some of the challenges that they face as a commission, the opportunities, and how it is that we can be able to stop corruption in this country. So we take a short break, but don't go too far. We'll be back in just a bit. Welcome back. If you're joining us, you're watching Walk in the Talk, our focus of discussion. Uh, today we are looking at the ongoing war on graft, particularly as we prepare to mark the International Anti-Corruption Day, which has been celebrated tomorrow. That is the 9th of December uh, 2019, assessing some of the gains and challenges that we continue to face. And of course, I am talking to retired Archbishop Eliud Wabukala, who is the chairperson at the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. I want to take you back to, you know, what we keep saying, the challenges that the Commission is facing in terms of moving forward and trying to address the problem of corruption. What would you say are some of the loopholes that Kenyans continue to exploit uh, that perhaps you will be looking into in terms of trying to stop graft? Thank you so much. I think, I think the challenges mainly are the ones around the investigation, enforcement by the law. And one of them is the people conceal evidence and in some places we have witnessed destruction of those evidences. For example, some county offices uh, have been put on fire and we suspect it's because they want to make sure that the evidence is not there. Uh, we also have delays in uh, obtaining evidence and uh, from, for example, if it's an international case, it has to, to do with uh, other countries, uh, but the law is trying to address that. So evidence, getting evidence is actually a very, very serious issue and tedious uh, because case courts will expect that uh, we provide very strong evidence for every case and so our officers must uh, comp anything that they are able to get to make sure that evidence is solid. So that's a challenge when we don't get cooperation. Sometimes uh, perhaps misreporting <laughs> by media, of course not. <laughs> Not every time, but media being a part of our our, our, our stakeholders, mm -hmm. when they report well, then it becomes good. But when they don't, it becomes a challenge. Uh, of course, as usual, everybody will not have money, but we have budgetary, budgetary constraints. constraints okay. Which, if we are given more, we could do more. Um, of course, the human resource capacity. Mm -hmm. We we need a lot of people, qualified people. Uh, for example, uh, lawyers, we need them. We need uh, valuers, we need uh, architects, engineers. You know, people who can do all this overall work that uh, can support the commission. So we are every time trying to improve on our capacity, uh, human capacity as well as uh, resource base. In terms of capacity here, uh, I mean, do you have enough officers to be able to undertake, you know, the mandate that is before you? Well, well so far we, we want to thank God because uh, the government has helped us really move from about 200 to now 750 above, which is okay, but uh, given a population of 47, now they talk of 47 million, <laughs> these are a few, because if you divide them into the six directorates, then you find uh, we don't have uh, enough, you know, 
how many lawyers, maybe we have about 60 on the uh, investigators, just people, intelligence officers, there are very few. So we need to make sure those uh, areas are supported. Education officers in the field, we need a lot of them. Um, perhaps to say that these challenges uh, impact on our growth. As I speak, we have 11 regions. Mm -hmm. We are now in Mombasa, we are in Nyeri, we are in Kisumu, we are in, uh, in Western, we are doing it in Bungoma, we have in uh, Northeastern, we have here in Machakos, we have uh, Kisi, you know, all around 11 regions. Yeah. And each region has to duplicate what happens at the headquarters. Mm -hmm. So that also poses our financial and resource capacity challenges. Mm -hmm. You've also mentioned the, the, the issue about uh, evidence and there was a time that ESCC, you know, was always accused, the officers were always accused of, you know, uh, missing files, evidence, you know, getting lost and those kind of things. You suffered a lot of, you know, integrity questions. Have you been able to address this? Well, for, from the time I joined this commission, I have not seen any serious uh, challenge on either loss of evidence or saying that evidence is not sufficient. Actually, when we do the cases here and they go to the DPP, we get almost 90% concurrence. He, he looks at the files and he always says, yes, this is right, I can go ahead and prosecute. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so far, we, we are doing that. I think that's part of the reporting that sometimes we have not been able to correct very fast. Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, internally, our officers are working very hard to ensure that uh, evidence is solid. And uh, by the way, <coughs> before a case goes to court, it's not just ESS which has looked at. The DPP's office has also many officers who then together look at that and confirm that indeed this evidence can sustain a, a, a successful prosecution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about, you know, what we see politicians saying every other time that this is witch hunt, this is, you know, targeted, uh, they, you know, and be targeted for, for this and that. How do you deal with that? Now, that is what I'm telling you, you are, when you talked about f uh, corruption fighting back. Yeah. Uh, it's not just politicians. In fact, just get anybody who is corrupt. He will say, well, I'm not corrupt. And then he will look for reasons. Some will say, it is our tribe or our clan, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> so this, we, we are used to that because... It's a way of trying to hide the reality. Uh, but as we go along with the case, it will prove to the public that surely we were looking, well, our focus is corruption, not where the person comes from, mm -hmm. whether in politics or in a tribe. Yeah. So that's part of the challenge, which we are using education to make sure it doesn't affect us. Kenyans always want to get you know results yesterday. And when it comes to corruption, you, you know, you always say it's a very complex web because this is sort of more like organized crime. Uh, uh, how do we, you know, in terms of having an, the anti-corruption court, has it helped in fast-tracking cases or is that still a problem that you face as a commission? You used to say you are a toothless dog, <laughs> quote unquote. Has that changed? Yes, you now I, have I, the, I, I think <laughs> the, the kind of structure that we have in this country is that um, ESCC is a lead agency on corruption. We do all the work I've said, but then the DPP does a prosecution, mm -hmm. and then the judiciary adjudicates. Now, what has happened in the reforms is that they have set aside a special anti-corruption uh, bench. Yeah. For me, that has helped a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of uh, cases progressing a little faster than before. Uh, perhaps just to go into figures of the late, latest figures, we, we had cases like about 74 or something in court, and we achieved 51 convictions straight away. Okay. So, and very fast. So I think if we proceed with this process where the, the cooperation between ESC, the DPP, and the courts have that seamless uh, uh, process, we are going to do a little more. And uh, for me, that's a, that's a plus for our judiciary to have set aside a special bench yeah. to deal with the corruption cases. Mm -hmm. What about convictions of the big fish? Because there's always the general feeling among the public that, you know, we go for the smaller fish, like you had indicated. So they want to see, you know, convictions for the big fish. 
Well, I, I, it depends on what you are calling big fish. As well. We have several. I, don't, I can't get the names right now, but we have permanent secretaries who have been convicted. Uh, we have, I think, directors. Um, we have middle-level managers, people who actually matter within uh, the procurement system, the management of, of, of resources in the public. They, are in, they have been uh, convicted. Um, so in terms of uh, what you are calling big fish, I think it is a cost cutting across board. Uh, whether the small one or the big one, for us, it is the same thing, mm -hmm. because it's corruption. But once you know you get there as a big fish, Mr. Mr. Chenga, what I can tell you is that uh, I think Kenyans must begin to realize how bad it is, just be, to be mentioned as corrupt. Um, it is not a good life, because first you lose friends, and then you begin to make your family suffer, psychologically, live alone, you know, get, get into the process of, of, of the court. So the entire process of being taken through a corruption issue affects this person, affects the people next to the person, and then it is, it's not a good thing. And that's why I always I say, why can't we stop it? So even if those you call big fish have not been, uh, for example, already convicted, but see the trend of the suffering that is all along that, you know. Mm -hmm. As even the case continues in the court, even if it drags years and years, what are the family members feeling like? Why are those friends that this person had, how are they feeling like? You know, all that process, people should see that as even a higher punishment than the and final one. And shaming in itself. You know, yeah. yeah, the final one, which will appear for one to go in, in jail, that would just be the tail end. But the whole process is a bad thing. So it's good for us to say, well, I can't we avoid these inconveniences to the many people that uh, look at us, you know, at that level. But do the young people, you know, have role models that they can look up to? Because if, if you look at, you know, our current situation, uh, you'd see some of the people who are actually mentioned in graft are the ones who go ahead and, and get elected. It's almost as if, as you know, the younger people idealize them. So how do you get the young people to get role models that they can identify with, people who, you know, would begin to bring the change that you're working towards? Well, I, I think as a country, we, we must say we have, we have been in a transition, uh, getting back to 1960s when independence was coming, uh, looking at the destruction of the traditional societies, looking at the religious experiences we have gone through and now into where we are, a lot has happened and the pressure on the young people, I don't blame them, has been very high. So what it means here is that through our own processes of developing the human being, all, all those processes must be looked at. At the level of the religious sector, for example, we have partnered and we have said help Kenyans to elect people of integrity. Um, we, we need to get back there so that uh, the leadership we bring up either through politics or through interviews to positions are people of integrity and that's where now your chapter 6 comes in. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. You mentioned the, you know, the religious institutions so how are you working with them to ensure that they instill these good values from that? particular tender age? That was again our first uh, engagement uh, when it came to this commission was that uh, we create a memorandum of understanding yes. with all the religious leaders which we have done uh, through the inter-religious council where we have the Muslims, the Hindus and the, all the Christians. Uh, just last month I think we, we launched uh, materials which will guide all these people, all these faith groups to uh, to teach their people on uh, things that are related to corruption but are actually found in their holy books. Mm -hmm. And so we launched a very aggressive campaign together, mm -hmm. which actually I called a movement towards uh, corruption free, uh, free Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to make that as a movement which will go back to the grassroots and help us to teach our people uh, 
of course, the value system that is good, but at the same time, as they do the electing of leaders, they look at not the money, but the kind of person they are electing. What about the issues that you know we've seen within the, the, the institutions, religious institutions, and particularly churches, the question of fundraising, which is what was happening in the debate the other day. What would you say about that particular? Should well, we not I, have fundraisers in church? I wouldn't want to go to that because churches have their own uh, issues. But when I was, I was archbishop myself, mm -hmm. I actually did not allow uh, to the cathedral here any uh, uh, what you call guest of honors or what have you. We just did ourselves, and I think every church needs to, or religious institution, need to do that which brings honor to them, and also will glorify God, uh, so that uh, we don't glorify individuals, uh, or we glorify wealth, but we glorify God, and we also bring honor to the institutions that we lead. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, most of them are doing that now. In the, in the forum that you say that you know you're working with religious institutions to try and look at issues of instilling values and, and, and good uh, within good values within the, uh, the church in itself is that a discussion that perhaps you've had because we've seen the Catholic Church pronounce it itself and saying you know now if you have uh, anything that you want to bring to the church you must declare you must give us a check those kind of things which which is okay but then again in terms of legislation is it something that we need to consider as a country? Um, I will not. I, I think uh, uh, from where you sit, you know, as the ESCC. Uh, as ESCC, for us, we, for us, we look for partnership, and uh, our partnership is respecting the institutional arrangement that is there, and uh, we also would judge that partnership in terms of the credibility of the institution that we have. For example, if you are a church, and we, we, in our estimation, we feel that you are not to the level of the integrity we want, we shall not partner with you. Instead, we become a focus of us in terms of uh, teachings and awareness to bring to that level. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do partnership with them, not just the religious sector alone. Yeah. Yeah, we have done so with the Matatu sector. We have uh, engaged the Kenya Law Society. Mm -hmm. We have engaged the private sector in the CAPSA. Actually, they are very active. And so we, we engage at the institutional level and then they have their own then codes and rules that guide them, which of course would respect the principles of our constitution and um, maybe chapter six. Mm -hmm. All right. Is it possible for us to stop corruption as a country? Well, it is possible to stop it if we said no to corruption individually. Um, because, as I said, corruption has many factors which fuel it, but at the level of stealing by public servants, I think that we can do. Because if we can get the public servants and make the accounting officers responsible for what happens within the institutions, so that they are the first whistleblowers, eh? I have told the governors the same that each governor should be the first whistleblower for what happens in their counties. That would go a long way in first setting the mentorship at the top and the tone, and that would lower down corruption a lot. If we achieve 80%, 90%, that would translate into a lot of money saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. For us to get there, of course, we have to look at the root causes. So, as you know, ESCC, what you know, would you say are some of the issues that you've identified that make people engage in corruption? Is it usually the values or is it just you know, a crime of opportunity? Well, uh, well, sometimes people talk of poverty, but I think it is, it is a, it's, it's a person. Uh, two, there are things like bribery. You know, bribery, some people are impatient. They, they go to a hospital instead of queuing to reach the doctor. They want to jump the line, and therefore they are ready to bribe. Uh, there is fraud. This is very intentional, where somebody uh, just cheats the system and gets the money. There is embezzlement of funds, and um, suppression of public funds, for example. Mm -hmm. this, these are the kind of things I'm trying to look at. Mm -hmm. 
which happen within the system. Uh, there are things like a breach of trust. Yeah? You know, when, you, when somebody holds a public office, he is entrusted with the power to serve people. But when you don't use that power to serve, you have broken the trust. And therefore, we need that to be just strengthened personally to ensure that we give a service. Uh, not a public office, not a, a business office, so not somewhere where you go to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, but as we talk about the public servants, then we must now allow ourselves in the villages not to see people in public offices as if when they come, they are, they are just having money. You know, like so, there was a place I, I saw how they deal with the MPs. The moment the MP approaches the village, they all follow the person as if it's an ATM now. <laughs> so that is uh, a concept we must change. These people are earning uh, to, to serve you, not earning to give you again. The culture of expecting that culture, we have to work on it. Um, it has developed, it has, uh, which is not very good for the future. Mm -hmm. What about you know the, the private sector? How are you you know working with them in terms of trying to address this particular, especially the crimes of opportunity often arise when the public sector and private sector work together? Well, with the private sector, what we, we, we are doing is that uh, first we encourage private sectors to set up uh, courts in, in their various institutions. So most of them have the codes of conduct, yes, or of ethics, and. Um, we, we, they, some have brought those codes of ethics to us, we, and we validate them. Mm -hmm. uh, we encourage them to, to now follow them when they are, they are there. Uh, we also uh, use them for, for awareness w within the institutions, you know, to, to tell their people about why, how they should stop corruption. Um, we partner with them in terms of um, uh, ed education, yes, that's ma mainly. But now that we have uh, the Bribery Act, we can actively then engage them when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, looking forward and seeing where we are, assessing, you know, the progress that you've made so far, what do you see happening, you know, in the coming years in terms of all the things that EACC is doing, the prevention, you know, the public now beginning to speak about incidences of corruption? Well, I think, uh, for me, um, if we want to win the war on corruption, first, we must maintain the stability of the institutions that fight corruption. Uh, especially ESCC, being now the lead agency, needs first to receive uh, everybody's support, uh, support uh, moral and actively, because when you want to lose war at all, you begin by attacking the integrity of those who are in that war. So that is important for the stability of, this, of the institution to be kept. Uh, also to pray for continued political will, support for the war and, and, and corruption, for continued legislative uh, support which we are enjoying about this war. Uh, then in the near future, of course, for the resources to be availed to these uh, institutions that fight corruption. But above all, for Wanaiji to really become a movement that stigmatizes corruption. Okay. As we move towards winding up, it's, I think January will be three years since you, you came into office. And if you look at you know when you came into office and, and the issues that were surrounding ESCC, there was a lot of turbulence at the time. Uh, in terms of a legacy, what would you say as some of the things that you've brought into the commission and long after you're gone, you will be remembered for them? Uh, <laughs> it's not always easy to, <laughs> to, to articulate what you have done. Yeah, but then for again. talk of legacies, I don't know. <laughs> but I know when, when I joined in January 2017, this, uh, this place was really a place, uh, a no-go zone. I remember nobody wanted to apply for this position, yeah. and we did not really feel that it's a place to go. But I thank God is that at least somebody had to do this job. So far, what has happened is that uh, we have brought in stability 
and tranquility. That was necessary. Uh, our officers and all people engaged in the corruption in this institution are working as a team. And for me, that stability is very crucial and it's, it's now bearing fruit. We have also noticed uh, visibility uh, of the commission, yeah. no, internally and also outside. I assure you that um, the inter uh, outside, there are many countries coming to benchmark with us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when people see them coming to benchmark, they say, oh, when I enter here, they say, kusoma kitu mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we so, talk about the image. Yeah, you've been able because to of the previous image. Yes. But I can assure you, we have had people from Namibia, from Tanzania, from Zanzibar, from Nigeria, and many others. Actually, Botswana, they have come here to do benchmarking. So the feasibility is there now. Uh, thirdly, I think we have now, during this period, have had uh, institutional capacity development. The, the, the institution has developed capacity, uh, for example, numbers from about 200 to now 750. Uh, we have opened many regional offices, as I can I said earlier, mm -hmm. 11 in this country now we are, we are looking for. Uh, we have also rationalized our approach to corruption because people are looking at, uh, uh, we, are only, we are living with only small fish, but we had to make a policy, a strategic policy to say we go for cases, that, uh, we go for prevention and deal with priority cases if it's high impact, uh, the value of money involved, and the personality that we, we do. And then we do asset tracing and uh, recovery of what they have stolen. Because somebody goes to steal because he's motivated to gain. So we make sure that is uh, deterred. And then we are still going to proceed with those high impact investigations and aggressive uh, public awareness. Um, above, all, above all, we have championed within this period uh, many legal reforms which are in the process. For example, the Bribery Act of Tola, uh, but we are creating many regulations yes. around it. Yeah. We are also dealing with a conflict of interest bill. We want to, as we, as we have already been talking about, uh, should the public servants be in business? In business. So we are working on, on legal regulations around that also. Uh, we are also very actively on income declaration forms. Our argument as ESCC is that um, these forms should be online, automated, and when they are declared, they are not, they are not supposed to be secret, like, it, like the law doesn't allow now uh, for, 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 for us to access somebody's form without maybe the court Allowing us, so we are trying to make a bill, uh, some laws around that. Won't it interfere with the right to privacy? Well, the, uh, uh, but now the right to privacy plus the uh, the danger of corruption, we have to weigh between the two. Uh, if, for example, I, I think it's not a problem because when I say I own three cows, what is the problem? If if it is shown on the on the internet or everywhere. I think the advantage is more than, uh, than my right to conceal. <laughs> and so that will help this country in terms of even uh, lifestyle audits, you know, and it will deter the uh, uh, accumulation of wealth uh, by people who are, who are advantaged to be in their offices. Our time is up, but I'll just you know, give you a minute to look straight into that camera and, and perhaps speak to the Kenyans as we mark the International Day, Anti-Corruption Day. Yeah. What would you want to see them change? Thank you so much uh, for my listeners and those who are viewing us. Uh, as we mark the International Anti-Corruption Day all over the world, I think it's a time for us as Kenyans to recognize that uh, corruption is uh, cancer, uh, corruption is right now the number one disease that we must fight in this country. And that corruption is not just <coughs> up there, it is also uh, right from our small families, uh, from our institutions at the village level, and it moves on up to the big offices. Let us take a decision on this important day to contribute to the war against corruption by deciding not to be corrupt.
That's the starting point. Uh, where you witness corruption, report it. We have uh, many channels. You can go to Huduma Centers. Uh, you can uh, visit one of our nearest, nearest offices. You can write to us anonymously. Please report the matter. But above it all, stop corruption. Where it has happened and you are a witness, come forward and uh, uh, support uh, the cases around it because we are all together in this war. So thank you so much for cooperating with us in the last two or three years. All right. Thank you very much, Chairman. We do appreciate your time and just giving us insights on what you're doing so far as you continue to educate the public and create awareness on why corruption is hurting our economy. Well, we have been talking to the chairperson of the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, that is a retired Archbishop Eliudu Bokala, just highlighting some of the things that the commission is doing and the importance of us to continue instilling national values to be able to reverse the problem of corruption. Of course, the world will be marking the International Day Against Corruption, that is on the 9th of December, and the theme this year is United Against Corruption. Can you unite against corruption? I will leave it to you to answer that question. My name is Katrina Chenga. Thank you for watching Walk the Talk. Do enjoy the rest of your viewing.